Our focus for the topic of the webinar this evening is the Central American diaspora in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. We are very pleased to welcome Professor Anna Patricia Rodriguez. And if you would like to start sharing your screen, we can get started. Okay, I will do that. Um, oops, I'm sorry, I opened a larger screen. Okay, so, um, um, hold on a second. Um, I'm not sharing yet, right? No, we can't see your screen. Okay, okay. Just want to make sure I have it queued. Um, I will um, start sharing now. Okay, how about now? Yes, we can okay. see your screen. Okay, so um, great. Um, um, before we get started, um, will you be sharing the slides with the attendees at the end? Um, if, if I may, um, yes, I'll share them. If I can um, send them to you after the presentation. Yes, I can email okay. them out then. Okay, okay. And, and, and also I will share a bibliography of works um, text on the Central American diaspora in this area with you so that people can, you know, read the text. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So let me um, uh, whiten my, my screen here and um, um, thank you for um, Arlington Public Libraries for inviting me to do this webinar. Thank you to Megan. Um, we've been talking, I think, you know, going back to the summer about um, holding this webinar and so it's it's a topic that's you know really close to my heart in fact you know I was a little late for this because I was finishing up teaching my um, Central Americans in the DMV class um, this semester and um, and I had um, some discussions that were going on and I had to you know kind of close shop there but um, it's it's a pleasure to be here and I'm really glad that um, I see that there are about 21 participants or so so thank you very much for being here on a Tuesday night um, when, of course, you know, you, you, you could be doing other things, but I'm, I'm really happy that, you know, you, you want to be here to learn um, about the cultural uh, production of Central Americans in the DMV. And so I will be um, talking a little bit about um, uh, myself, you know, not giving you too many stats about the population here, but, you know, I'll reference, you know, some of the demography. But what I wanted to really focus on, and it's something that the library was interested in me doing, was, you know, talking about the literature, the text, um, the cultural scene of um, Central Americans in this area. And I'm always surprised that, you know, um, a lot of times we're not aware that this is a really rich cultural area in terms of Central Americans and that there's a lot of cultural production that's going on that I'm hoping to be able to share with you and, um, and then you'll be able to go on and, and read about it in the literature itself and, and some of the, the literature that's out there. So I've titled this talk um, and you'll see that it's kind of bilingual um, as, as am I. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about myself, but I'll focus, you know, particularly on the cultural production of the diaspora here in the DC area. So I've titled the talk, the El Arte de la Diaspora Centroamericana Salvi, Salvi for Salvador, in, in el DMV. So the art of the diaspora, uh, um, the, the Central American diaspora, the Salvadoran diaspora in the DMV. And, um, and this is the translation of the subtitle is right here, but I wanted to highlight the art of the diaspora. So I will, will start with a little story about myself. Um, I am an immigrant. I was born in El Salvador and um, my parents immigrated to the San Francisco Bay Area, in fact, to San Francisco when I was five. And um, I always, you know, um, like to, you know, situate myself so um, audience understands that I am part of the diaspora. I am an immigrant. Um, I've been um, inspired by not only my migration, my parents' migration and their generation, but all the generations that have been migrating to date. And so um, I wanted to preface the talk with um, um, some photos and actually a digital story titled Cinco, Five where I tell my story in about, I don't know, uh, one minute and 52 seconds. 
that um, we might not have a chance to, to look at here, but it's on my Vimeo channel. And um, once you get the PowerPoint, you can look up the link um, or use the link to, to see um, um, my Vimeo channel where I'm collecting stories by Central Americans in this area, a project that I have with my students dating back to 2010, I believe, where we've been doing short videos on different aspects of the diaspora in, in the area in an effort to build an archive that can be of use to the public, but also to the public schools and, um, and other people who might be interested. But I just wanted to you know, kind of show you, this is myself on the day that we were leaving the airport um, to, um, to immigrate to the United States. This is my mother. My mother is of, um, um, of African descent, Jamaican, and so um, by way of Honduras. And so then she um, migrated. Um, she must have been in her late, uh, early 30s. And these are my grandparents. And this is my sister who migrated. This was the family that came to drop us off, a great tradition in Central America where the whole family will come to the airport to drop you off, to pick you up. So the, the last images you have are a family. And this is a picture when I'm about the same age, the same year, now living in, in San Francisco, this is Dolores Park um, in the heart of the mission where we lived. The mission district um, was up through gentrification, the Latino, Mexican, um, Latinx um, neighborhood. And we arrived in 1969, in fact, on um, the 5th of May, Cinco de Mayo, that was precisely the day that we arrived at SFO, San Francisco airport. And it was a very interesting time. San Francisco was, you know, the, the, the hippie era. It was in between summer of love, a lot of activism. And if you'll see here, you know, I, um, I was not conscious of this back then, but of course, this is also the area of a lot of um, social activism. So free Huey, Huey, um, um, Huey, uh, Huey Seals or Huey Newton were, were talking about the Black Panthers. Viva Los Siete was another group, um, Latino group that was very, um, um, was accused of, of, of killing a police officer in um, San Francisco right at that moment. And so it was a very contentious era. That's where I grew up and was inspired, as I said, by the stories of Central Americans and other Latinos um, in my own work. and. Um, and recalling back, this is what, you know, actually inspired me to be a professor, to focus on Central America, and now to be teaching at UMD, where I teach classes on the Central American diaspora, on Latinx in the United States. And, um, and, and so that's kind of the frame that, that you know, um, inspires me to, to teach in this area. Um, I, I, before I, you know, I get too far, I wanted to um, kind of, uh, and um, put out there that, you know, the, there's a book right now that has just been published by one of my colleagues, Roberto Lovato, Unforgetting, a memoir of family migration gangs and revolution in the Americas. So at this moment, I would, you know, first um, recommend that this is a good place to start to learn about Centro America, El Salvador, um, the, the whole history. He goes back to, you know, um, the colonial period and he talks about just waves of different histories that propelled migrations out of Centro America, amongst them his own migration and his family's migration. So he tells a story, also a San Franciscan raised um, Salvadoran, he tells that story. And um, again, it's a good start if you want to, you know, get a crash course on Salvadoran history. And it's been highly um, reviewed. In fact, um, the great poet Carolyn Forche, who teaches at Georgetown University and has written, you know, a series of poetry, poetry books, she um, does a review in the New York Times that was published just recently, September 1st, 2020, which was the date of the publication, uh, the release of the book. So Unforgetting, uh, um, it, it, the title reflects, you know, the process of actually actively um, remembering and recuperating these histories, which is the task of the diaspora. So I would recommend that book to start with. Um, a little bit on the background of the Central American uh, diaspora migrations. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a long history, so I won't belabor, but a, a little context always helps. So um, I always, you know, uh, like to dig, give a panorama of the history of the Salvadoran and Central American migration, which a lot of us tend to identify with the 1980s, the Civil War, 
the 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 violence that you know sent off great migrations a lot of um of the people who migrated in the 1980s actually came to the dc area that's part of the foundational story but the history of the salvadoran diaspora migration goes further back in fact to the 19th and 20th century there's documentation right of um um, um miners salvadoran miners um, who uh, participated in the gold rush of 1849 in, um, in Northern California. Um, there are letters, there's, there used to be a genre at that, at that time where when people were unsuccessful, minors, and they were returning back to their homelands, they would write a farewell letter. So there's documentation of farewell letters that um, a few gold miners wrote back then when you know they they weren't able to become rich off of you know their gold mining exploits and so they were returning to their country and so that documents the presence of Salvadoran and others along with you know Chinese miners and um, and uh, white miners etc right a very also um, conflicted period where um, there was a, a, a lot of um, a lot going on to exclude, for example, Chinese miners, the Chinese Mining Act, and so forth, right? So um, Salvadorans, you know, can be dated, their presence can be dated to, you know, the 19th century, if not earlier. Um, the construction of the uh, Panama Canal and the railroad, the initial railroad through the Panama Canal zone also, you know, brought people to the different um, um, points of entry or um, the, the openings of, of the Pacific Coast and the Atlantic Coast, vice versa, of, of Panama, which brought migrants uh, on boats to San Francisco and to New York. So there's also documentation of that flow of people early on. The construction of the Panama Canal and the labor and the labors also brought labors up north. Um, of course, the 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 production, the agro-industrial production of coffee and bananas, uh, the United Fruit Company also um, opened up a flow of migrants to um, New Orleans, Central American Honduran migrants to New Orleans, um, coffee um, workers to San Francisco, where a lot of the companies like Hills Brothers and Folgers Coffee, their headquarters were established there. So already there was an infrastructure for people moving to those cities early on. And then, you know, we move into, you know, the 20s, 50s, an era of um, dictatorships um, in great part of Latin America and also in Europe, right, fascism and everything. And so Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez is probably the, the, the most well-known di dictator of, um, of Central America, of El Salvador, in 1932. He ordered the execution, the massacre of, um, of what were really indigenous peoples. And so um, a lot of, um, of indigenous people were either killed, massacred, you know, over, uh, I, I think it was a, a one month period, or they were forced to go underground because of the repression. So a lot of people also dissidents fled the country. They came again to where um, enclaves have been established in San Francisco, New York, and so forth. And so that wave of um, political migration associated with um, um, issues, uh, political instability in Central America occurred throughout the 20th century. The um, dictatorships, the um, overthrow of Presidente Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala in the coup d'etat of 1954, which was orchestrated by the United States, that also produced the flow of migrants. So it was a recurrent wave of migration. Um, in the mid um, 20th century to the present, um, there's been a labor migration. Um, there's been um, um, head of household migration. Um, an interesting story about Washington DC is that women um, came as um, uh, groundbreakers. In other words, they were the first people in their family to migrate. Um, Terry Repack, who is, I believe, a um, historian, has a book called um, Waiting on Washington, where she tells the story of the first migrants, Salvadoran migrants to this area, to the Washington DC area. And many of the um, migrants who came originally were affiliated with embassies or um, international organizations, people that, that um, you know, of course there were um, the diplomats and so forth, but usually the diplomats also brought their 
um, the people that worked in their household, brought nannies, gardeners, and, and, and others. And so um, a flow was established of, of, of people who came with you know, these high-end um, international diplomats. And so a lot of people came to stay or stayed and they brought other families and that's how you establish social networks, enclaves, and um, these mutual um, societies that help one another informally. And these um, so, uh, social enclaves and networks were established in places like DC, LA, San Francisco. So this is all to say that um, the migration to DC came you know, early on, early, early on uh, with the diplomatic corps. Um, more recently, and this is probably the migration that is more well known, um, the, the migrations associated with the civil wars in Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, also migration that is economic because of the political instability and um, family reunifications that happen with, you know, people helping one another, reunifying in the United States. And this migration, of course, as we know, it only, you know, we only have to look at the news and, you know, all the debates and discussions about immigration today, that the migration continues and now even um, in, a, in a more um, heightened, dangerous um, level. So we have an economic, environmental, global migration, uh, a migration that's associated with, you know, violence, a violence that, you know, is linked to, uh, again, economic instability, um, the lack of resources, um, social inequities, social political inequities, et cetera, in the region. So all those things are connected that prompt people to migrate. So I wanted to give you like um, a context for understanding the migration and why um, Salvadoran and Central American immigrants come to this area. Um, again, reasons for migration, these are, are very current reasons, lack of employment opportunities, high levels of socioeconomic inequality and political instability. Um, increase in organized crime and increase in social political violence. Violence is always, you know, a, 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 pu a push factor, right? Um, and there is a correlation between communities from which people immigrate and levels of violence and homicides recorded in those sites. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, immigrants who are fleeing violence at this point, you know, coming to the United States. But again, you know, the violence is due to um, just, you know, great um, precarity in, in, in the region. And family reunification being one of, you know, um, an important force that pulls people to areas like the Washington DC DMV area because, you know, families, parents want to reunite with their kids. They send for their kids or, you know, uh, kids come to reunite, reun reunify with their families. And, um, and of course, you know, the United States up until the pandemic, you know, um, especially the Washington DC area with the construction, with, you know, the hospitality industry, with um, the need for domestic workers, it was always an area that demanded unskilled labor and prompted these migrations from Central America. A little bit more context. So I, I uh, this is just one graph that I'm going to show you here um, because I wanted to emphasize and this is a, um, a graph from, the, from 2005 from the Migration Policy Organization. And um, um, Dr. Ronald Luna from the Department of Geographical Sciences at UMD um, um, allowed me to use this graph. And so um, I want to point out, right, um, we all, uh, most of us know that Los Angeles is par excellence the city, the area that um, has the, the largest number of Latino immigrants from across um, Latin America. Mexico, immigrants from Mexico being the largest group. Um, and, you know, uh, everyone else, I always like to say everyone, all, uh, uh, every immigrant, uh, Latino immigrant is represented in Los Angeles. But interestingly enough, right, you know, we see that New York, and we know that New York has a lot of Caribbean immigrants and so forth. The Washington DC area is, is the third largest or the third metropolitan area with the largest population of, of immigrants from Central America. LA first, New York, and then Washington DC. And, um, and th this number, right, is, is higher. Um, there is an undercount of, uh, from, uh, there's obviously more than 276,000 Central Americans in the area. There is an un undercount because of course, there is a great um, number of, of immigrants who might be undocumented. They might be not counted. So there's lots of reasons for undercount, but the Washington, um, Arlington, Alexandria um, area, the DMV is an area that um, has that 
highest, one of the highest number of Central American migrants. In fact, uh, the DMV and the DC Metro, Northern Virginia included, have the highest concentration of Central American migrants in all of the United States. Um, the, the largest number of Salvadorans amongst all Latino groups in this area, the Salvadorans are the largest group. So that is very particular to this area. That, that is not the case of Los Angeles, New York, Miami, where Cubans are the largest Latino group. New York, again, uh, people from the Caribbean, from the islands. Houston has a great number of Central Americans, but not as you know, um, big as um, Washington DC. And San Francisco is, is also like, you know, on the list, but not, um, does not have as many Salvadoran immigrants as we have here in the DC area. So that's very important because when we think of Latinx and Latino, um, culture in, um, in the DC Metro DMV, Northern Virginia area, um, we think of certain things and I'll be curious um, to hear from um, our viewers, you know, what they identify Latinx culture by. If you say pupusas, um, you are thinking Salvadoran, right? Because that is one of the, um, the typical foods of Salvadorans. And so um, pupusas are very much referential to uh, Salvadoran culture. So that is a big marker of the presence of Salvadorans here, the restaurants, the music, et cetera, right? Um, I wanted to show you this, uh, this, um, this um, image, which is a painting by um, Carla Rodas, who goes by her artistic name, Carlissima. And the title of the painting is Indigenous Lament, painted in 2004. And it's um, an interesting representation of a woman crossing over, right? And um, I, I usually do with my students an exercise of reading the painting, right? What it signifies, how it represents, you know, her crossing over from um, what seems to represent um, an, a representation of a tropicalized place, right? Because I can't rightly say it's Central America, but we see, we see a pyramid, we see a, we see a volcano, which is very much a, a signifier for um, Central America. And we see, you know, a bit of magical realism, right? Um, we see the woman crossing over with uh, one foot on what appears to be um, the steps of the Capitol. Um, the Washington Monuments, I don't know, Edwardian houses, uh, buildings, DC. But DC is, is pictured as, as gray. Um, she is transitioning, right, in, in mid-step, literally, right, with one foot, a sandaled foot on, on what appears to be a lima, I, I think, and a foot um, with a high heel. And she is transitioning right in the middle, in the third space, crossing over from this very ideal, very nostalgic view of, of you know, her homeland. And um, we get the idea that, you know, I mean, she's not stopping, she's in movement. We don't know if she crosses over because that's how she's captured. But her, um, her face, right, doesn't necessarily express uh, an image or uh, um, happiness the affect there is very complicated, right? So if, if we can discuss this later, it would be great. You know, what does her face, her expression, what does it signify? What does coming to the United States mean for her? What is she leaving behind? Um, all these things I think are, are really, uh, at least to me, they mean a lot in terms of her crossing over and what that migration process looks like. So I, I start with this image because it is by a DC Salvadoran um, painter, Carlissima, who resides in Adams Morgan. She has murals throughout DC and um, paints you know, from her studio. You can visit her website on the internet to see you know, more of her work. And it's always you know, a little bit of magical realism, very fantastical and very woman-centered, which is you know, something that I like, right? So, um, we, we do have an arts movement here in DC. This is one painting by this uh, painter. We also have the work of Ka, um, Frida Larios who uh, paints also murals. Um, she is uh, author of a book to learn um, the new alphabet of um, Maya in, in a new Maya language that she's kind of hybridizing. And um, she works a lot you know, with children in terms of storytelling 
and um, that is another artist in this area. Um, there is also um, a young artist that um, we're familiar with, Rafael Rodriguez, who is himself um, an uh, unaccompanied minor who paints a beautiful image that I will add to the slide so you can have that image of, of a mother um, that is pictured as uh, in the image of the Statue of Liberty with a child signifying right the migration of child migrants and the search for um, safe haven. So we have a lot of different representations that you know represent kind of the different um, eras and the different uh, contexts of migration of Central Americans. Um, I don't know that we'll have time um, because I think we only have about an hour, um, but I'm going to recommend to you the work of um, Kike Aviles, and I'll come back to this video if I can, but he does um, personal um, sketches of, of different characters based on um, people that he has interviewed and compilations of people that um, he, that live in, uh, and, and work in DC. So he, in this particular um, piece of Latin hood, he represents a scene of, of, a, of a woman, um, uh, and it really is about gentrification and about the transformation of Washington DC, Salvadoran, Salvadoran labor. And so it's it's a beautiful piece that shows the contrast and oftentimes the conflicts of not understanding one another, but the importance of Salvadoran labor in this area um, that you know it's important to recognize. So uh, I'll try to um, come back to that um, at the end. But I wanted to share with you, and this is one of the poems that you know we will um, I will um, list in my bibliography. Okay. And um, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you. This is one of my favorite poems by Kike Aviles, El Salvador at a Glance. And he's talking about coming to Washington DC and becoming Washingtonian. And Washingtonian, you'll see I've highlighted throughout the poem, is um, kind of mimicked on the way that um, oftentimes um, we Salvadorans will say the name of Washington as Washingtonian. And so, um, I will read this and, and, and get a sense of the humor and the irony that um, Kike Aviles implements in this work. And so this poem is also modeled on those sketches, country sketches, but he's gonna give us another image of El Salvador, okay? So he says, um, area, the size of Massachusetts, population, not much left, language, war, blood, broken English, Spanish, customs, survival, dance, uh, birthday parties, funerals, major exports, coffee, sugar, city builders, busboys, waiters, poets. El Salvador, there are questions in the air about your character. They say you've dared to do the impossible. You've challenged the tiger to a wrestling match. You've decided the bullets hold the answers. El Salvador, little question mark, midget with a gun in his hand, belly button of the world. The only country in the world known for eating its national fruit. Little question mark that begins to itch. You were supposed to clean carpets, not ask for time out and dialogue. You were supposed to follow instructions given in the English language, not go to the garden and write a song. It has been said that pain has the ability to travel in Salvador's major cities, San Salvador, San Miguel, Santa Ana, Los Angeles, San Washington, DC. It has been said that Payne does not know how to pose for a green card picture. It has been said that truth has the ability to happen in the strangest moments, in the strangest cities, under the strangest circumstances. El Salvador is Washington, little question mark, little east of the border, migrant earthquake, wetback volcano, banana eating, tortilla making, mustache holder, funny dressing. Forever happy, forever sad, forever Washingtonian, Salvadorian. Um, as a Salvadoran, this this uh, poem really um, touches touches me deeply, because I think it captures the sense that you saw in the image of the woman crossing over, this ambivalence, this yearning for homeland, and yet right being in another location and establishing yourself 
and becoming in a sense, right, I, I highlighted for you the, the three instances of Washington, 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 Salvador, um, this, this sense of becoming a diasporic subject, somebody, a Salvadoran from Washington, and um, the state, the emotional state of this, this persona is being forever happy, forever sad, um, forever in between, forever being um, not quite this, not quite that. In Spanish, we have a saying, ni de aquí, ni de allá. So forever Washingtonian kind of caught in suspension. And that is the same feeling, I think, that you see in the face of that woman in that um, uh, painting by Carla Rodas, Crossing Over, being in between, being caught, perhaps because of um, migratory status, Perhaps, you know, because of the status of TPS, which right now, you know, is, is, is being um, canceled in February, in November 2021. So this larger um, condition of being in between is very much captured by these two texts, one being the painting and one being this poem. And, you know, um, I think it captures the sense of, of Salvadoranness in, in Washington, D.C. And there's a lot of interesting things in this poem, right? That um, major exports, um, yes, coffee, you know, um, sugar, right? But also it's people that have been migrating and have been migrating as laborers to particularly the United States, particularly Washington, DC. So we have been exporting our own people so that, you know, they can come to the United States and work and send, you know, remesas, remittances, which is, you know, um, the, the capital that sustains El Salvador, it's, you know, at, um, right now it's at almost $5 billion a year. And so the essential labor of these migrants is not only essential here in the United States, but it's essential for the families that live and depend on, on, on these uh, migrants who live in the United States, particularly Washington, D.C. And so you could analyze this poem, and I could go on for days, right? But also it talks about, right, um, the, the question of identity, right? So there's, a, uh, it talks about being the little question mark, you know, who, who are you? Who is Salvadoran, right? Um, it references some of the names that El Salvador has been called. I don't know if you're aware that um, um, the great Chilean poet, Gabriela Mistral called it El Salvador, um, um, the little Tom Thumb, El Pulgarcito. And so that's why if you, um, if uh, there are restaurants in Washington DC called El Pulgarcito and that references the thumb, which is the name that um, Gabriela Mistral gave to El Salvador because it's the smallest country of you know, um, the, the isthmus. And belly button was what um, the great um, also Chilean poet Pablo Neruda called Centro America, the belly button of the world, right? Also, I think um, um, the great liberator of Latin America um, called um, the Isthmus also the belly button of the, um, of, of the is, uh, excuse me, of the Americas. Um, so very much um, Washington DC is now part of this larger mapping of Central Americans. And that's why I, I like to put the map of Central America as the background of my PowerPoint here. Um, so um, just th these lines I think are very poignant. Um, you were supposed to clean carpets, not ask for time out in dialogue. You were supposed to follow instructions given in the English language, not go in the garden and write a song. So I think there in the poem, um, Kike Aviles is also saying, we're also poets, right? The country has exported poets himself amongst them. So it's also a very personal poem about his own migration when he migrated from El Salvador at the age of 15 in 1980, precisely at the start of the Civil War, because he was a student activist in El, in El Salvador, and he migrates to Washington, D.C., and in Washington, D.C., he works, he's an activist, and he works with different groups, and, um, and he's been writing, you know, um, chronicling the lives of Salvadorans in D.C. for many years now. So I, I really invite you to look up his work. You can find him on the internet, there are videos, there are interviews with the Library of Congress, with Kike Aviles reading his work. So um, very beautiful work. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, I've been talking a lot about uh, diaspora. So I just wanted to, um, to um, kind of contextualize. And, and I see here that I left it actually in, in bilingual, right? 
So um, it's used as a analytical tool to understand the human ph um, phenomena of migration and relocation, right? And it's the idea, and I'm sorry it is in, in Spanish, but we can learn a little Spanish here. It's the idea that, you know, the world is always in flux and move, movement, uh, people migrating, right? And that it can be studied. We study um, diasporas in context. And so um, that's why I gave you a little historical context on the migration of Central Americans before. So basically, a diaspora is the di dispersion of people from a homeland because of you know certain conditions occurring in the moment historical conditions whether they be violence whether they be enslavement as you know the uh, african diaspora um you know um is 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 a is a result right of um the the taking of peoples by force from their homelands and you know enslaved so that is one of the important um diasporas and so um, here again, a little Spanish with a little, some questions, but there are different types of uh, diasporas, victim diasporas that have to do right with um, different um, um, moments of great violence, labor by, uh, diasporas of, of workers brought to work in different lands, imperial, um, where for example, the British, you know, in, in their relationship to India, trade, uh, migrating for trade, and um, victim diaspora too also includes the enslavement of Black peoples in the Atlantic trade um, and sl slave trade, and um, and deterritorialization, which is more of a contemporary where people you know are displaced and, and they move about. So I would put Salvadoran diaspora and amongst all these you know um, a diaspora due to you know displacement because of war, but also because of economic you know uh, reasons, migrating, deterritorializing, and living in different cultures and, and forming you know their own culture. Um, I won't go into this, but you know, I think it, it, it'll, you might be able to um, um, look at some of the, the common features of diaspora, which, which are listed here. One of which is the connection, even if it's imaginary, with the homeland. That's a very important feature of a diaspora. As you saw in the image, the painting by Carla Rodas, the woman is facing back and looking at um, Central America in a very nostalgic, very idealistic way. So she has reimagined um, Central America or the homeland she's leaving in these very idealistic, nostalgic terms. So that's something that often happens in diaspora when we look back and reconfigure and we rethink our homeland. Now, in the case of El Salvador, um, the Salvadoran War, 1979 to 1992, completely displaced, you know, a great part of the population. 80,000 Salvadorans were killed, 30% of the population displaced, more disappearances, um, people who were never found and are still being found in, you know, in fosas, in, um, in, in unmarked grave sites. Um, so it was a very, very critical era that displaced, um, many more people that, than we can imagine. And some of them you know, migrated to, um, to the Washington DC area, as I've been saying. This image, um, for those of you who are archivists, um, is an image that um, um, I, I was able to, um, that um, I, I did research at the Museum of the Word and the, the image, Museo de la Imagen y la Palabra, which is, a library, it's, it's an archive in San Salvador that has archived the photographs and recordings of the Civil War. So, um, so a lot of you know, important images, a lot of archiving visual material is found there. So I, 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 I wanted to show this image because of the impact, the impact of what that war um, had in that area, in, in Central America, right? So um, next, you know, um, I also, this is an image that I saved I, I must have been a teenager, and this uh, this was the cover of the New York Times magazine. In um, I can't see the the uh, February eighth, nineteen eighty nine, and I must have been mm, a, a late teenager. Like uh, was I in college? No, I was already in college. But anyways, I was uh, an archivist, and I saved a lot of materials. And so, of course, you know, we have to recognize that the United States had great impact in, um, in Centro America and that um, this civil war was, you know, in great part funded by the United States at, you know, a million, two million a day at, at, you know, the height of the civil war. 
And then over a 12 year period, you know, 4.2, $4.5 billion of US economic aid went towards that war that displaced and, you know, really um, disappeared and killed a lot, a lot of people. Um, again, this is an image from the Museo de la, Pala, de la, Ima, de la Palabra y la Imagen, um, where, you know, um, we see the impact of displacement, internal displacement. You can imagine what the external displacement was like, people fleeing the country, having to cross multiple borders, cross the U.S. border in order to seek safe haven in the United States. This was the 80s, but it's very much today with the migration that we're seeing with, you know, the migrants being seeking asylum at the border, and yet, you know, um, more restrictive policies are being passed. And so we're in a very critical period right now. And um, this is from the Inter-American Dialogue, just to show you the impact of remittances. You know, migrants uh, immigrate, but, you know, uh, um, their migration has to do with these flows and, you know, flows of capital. And so El Salvador, as I've been mentioning, is a great um, remittance center. So here uh, I've been mentioning $5 billion El Salvador cents. So the chart here shows 4.280, but um, it's in, in that ballpark, right? Of, you know, almost $5 billion a year that Salvadoran immigrants send to their country to aid, you know, their families and so forth. And that is, you know, what um, the immigrants here in the Washington DC raise or, or work and send and um, to their, their loved ones in their country. Um, you will have this uh, slide, but um, I, I, I share with you, um, we will not have time, but um, I told you about the archive that I'm building with my stories that document that, um, that kind of represent the migration of Central Americans to this area. So one of, um, an example is a story about the Mount Pleasant area, the neighborhood and um, the, the Salvadoran arrival. Amor a la distancia, love at a distance, is a story of one of my students whose parents had met as children. And each of them went their way, migrated, and then they re-encounter each other here in DC by chance, and they, they, they marry and form a family. A, a very beautiful story by a student. Also stories about Langley Park, the work of Casa de Maryland, the transformation of La Culmore in um, Northern Virginia. So um, very interesting what happened at the 7-Eleven when they started selling pupusas and other Salvadoran foods, right? Which now is, is a staple, I think, across the, the, this area. So again, Salvadorans are the third largest Latino group in the United States after Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, um, displacing Cubans for third place. Salvadorans are the largest um, Latino group in the DC um, DMV area. Um, uh, here they are, right? Comprise the largest number of Latinos in the DC metro area. And um, we, I mentioned in an earlier slide, the undercount. The Salvadoran embassy has kind of calculated that there could be upwards, you know, of a million Salvadorans in this whole area, right? Um, but that would be hard to substantiate because we don't have, you know, the, 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 num the evidence. In other words, you know, the, the numbers. Um, um, because of, you know, the undercount. Um, and also, you know, there's an undercount because a great part of the population is undocumented, but um, nonetheless, the DC metro area has the highest concentration of Salvadorans in the US. And again, um, sending back 4 billion to 5 billion remittances outpacing um, the gross national product, which in the past had been coffee, but has not been for a long time. Um, visual presence of the, of the um, Salvadoran Central American migration, of course, in the festivals pre-pandemic. Um, the Latino festivals on the mall were always, you know, very um, significant in the way that um, there was a visual representative representation of the diversity of Latinos, Latinx in this area, through the music, through the parades, through, um, through the foods. Uh, hopefully after the pandemic, we'll be able to, you know, go back to having festivals. Um, this is, and these are images, photographs that I took from the, um, the DC Latino Festival on Mount Pleasant on September 25th, 2011. And um, what I found very, very interesting was that um, it opened with, the festival opened with a, um, a ceremony by a Guatemalan um, shaman, shaman, and, you know, paying honor to the four cardinal points, north, south, um, east and west, right? 
especially important I wanted to mention because yesterday was um, um, El Dia de, of Indigenous Peoples in Latin America, El Dia de la Raza, El Dia de los Pueblos Originarios. And so um, there has been, you know, a, a great migration of um, Indigenous peoples to this area from Bolivia, from, you know, Guatemala and other areas. But the diversity again is very great. People from Panama, you can see in the shirts, everybody enjoys, you know, um, being represented, Nicaragua, um, Honduras, um, El Salvador, right? And this is also from that, uh, a later festival. I think this might have been a couple years back. And then um, I love this photo that I asked permission from these young people to take. And you know, the 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 people who come together, the the um, the um, uh, mixed couples, right? So uh, very representational that you know this young woman has the U.S. flag and the Salvadoran flag, and he has his Guatemalan shirt, and they're in their full regalia of Central Americanness. Um, um, I know that I need to be closing, but um, also um, the presence of, 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 of I think, um, our history here in, in D.C., in the D.C. metro area is, is very, very poignant, right? This is an image of a commemoration to Oscar Romero, the assassinated archbishop who, is now, who, has, who has been sainted by um, Pope Francis. And so then this um, was, um, I think, on his, 20, on his 30th anniversary of his death, right? Um, he, he was beatified by Pope John Paul in 1997, but Monsignor Romero, for many of us, remains a hero, remains someone that worked for social justice in Centro America. So I always like to honor him too, right? And so a little bit about um, Salvadoreños in DC. Um, in 1980s, right, there was a lot of activism. Uh, Salvadorans came here because um, I think, um, first of all, there were already other migrants who, you know, um, helped um, their friends, helped their family um, seek safe haven, especially in the context of the Civil War. Um, very interesting, too, there are organizations that form in the D.C. area, especially around um, Columbia Heights and Mount Pleasant, um, of organizations that assist refugees. Um, so we had churches, we have politicians, organizations like Carece and the Central American Resource Center that um, still has his offices on Columbia Road that um, assisted, you know, um, people uh, fleeing violence in Centro America. Um, always, you know, um, the problem of vivienda, of housing, expensive vivienda, right? You know, the, the kind of the struggles that our immigrants go through, it, you know, it goes way back, right? So we're seeing um, heightened for, heightened, um, um, gentrification in, in, in uh, DC, and um, that goes way back, right? And um, the struggle with laws, and so, you know, there's, there's always been a lot of activism about immigration laws, so our, our immigrants on the ground, they work with, you know, these organizations, CARES and, and, and so forth, to actually um, lobby in terms of, you know, immigration law. So this is, you know, a pamfleto, it's a newsletter from way back in the 1980s of all the organizing that was happening around the Mount Pleasant and Columbia Heights area to aid Central American immigrants. Um, Carecen is, is a big organization right here. They have the Código of El Mojado, the, the Código, it's a declaration on behalf of um, undocumented people. And so there was a lot of political activism in assisting the migrants. Um, I've mentioned Kike Aviles. We read his poem. Um, here he is when he first migrated at age 15, and he becomes, you know, a a, a poet of the of the streets, a poet of the barrio from you know when he arrived in his teenage years. So I always like to say that he is the bard of the Latino community in Washington D.C. Here he is on. Um, uh, probably, you know, the month that he arrived, I think that's what he told me, right, when he was 15, in um, 1980. In 2010, he produced a work called Los Treinta that documented, based on oral histories, 30 years, 1980 to 2010, of the migration associated with the Civil War to Washington, D.C. It was a great piece. Um, um, we at the University of Maryland, my students and I um, assisted him in um, compiling oral histories, gathering oral histories for this project that was very ethnographic based. 
And so just, uh, I think to close off, um, I want to um, kind of give you an expose of other literature that, um, that, um, that um, you can, that, that are by um, poets and other writers of the Washington DC area, um, bilingual in Spanish and English, um, um, Carlos Parada um, Ayala, he's one of the editors of Al Pie de la Casa Blanca at the foot of the White House. So here, I think uh, it's a bilingual um, book. So there are um, translations of the poems here. And um, another po uh, book also, including um, Carlos Parada Ayala, who is a, a poet of, of this region and has lived here for many, many years, knocking on the door of the White House. So interesting, you know, the metaphor of the White House, living under the, you know, the White House, et cetera, is very prevalent for the, our writers. Um, uh, Aquí en Corresponda, um, you can find Lito Gonzalez, who is a musician, a writer of music. He's also an educator. Um, you can find his songs, beautiful songs about the Central American migration on YouTube. Aquí en Corresponda, his whole CD is on YouTube. So he's a singer, a songwriter, and, um, and he's, uh, his messaging is about immigration and about immigrating to Washington, DC, but he's compiled or he's um, put out a, a lot of CDs um, for children. So um, very interesting. So he's performed in venues like the Kennedy Center at festivals, and you can also find his CDs at his website. So we have musicians that are you know, writing about Washington, DC. Um, Mario Ben Castro, um, another writer, of Washington DC. Um, he writes probably what is the first novel about the central migration to Washington DC, Odyssey to the North, Odisea al Norte in Spanish. And um, if you want to get an early um, uh, uh, microscopic look at a Salvadoran migration to DC, this is the book, Odyssey to the North. And it's the story of migrants that come through Mexico, settle in Washington DC, and their you know, everyday, everyday struggles, right? but also their resilience. And Paraíso Portátil is another book, bilingual, that has a compilation of short stories. And there's a beautiful story there called Las Ilusiones de Juana, Juana's Dreams. And it's a story of a woman who lives in Arlington, Virginia. And um, she travels every year to, her, to El Salvador um, for Las Fiestas de Agosto. And um, on, on one occasion, um, she becomes enamored of these beautiful aguacates. Any of you who've traveled to El Salvador will note these huge, humongous, delicious aguacates. So she brings back the seeds and she plants um, the seeds in, um, indoors in a pot. But when um, she plants or re replants the, the avocados outdoors in the middle of summer, um, they die, the avocado dies. And so then um, it become, the story becomes a, kind of a metaphor of then, you know, um, her acculturation and her relationship with El Salvador. And um, when the avocados died, something dies within her and she calls her sister and she says, I, I won't be home next summer. I, I, you know, so it's a very profound story about migration and adaptation. And the great thing too is that, you know, it takes place in Northern Virginia and I think it captures well um, the, the kind of angst a lot of times that, you know, we feel as immigrants of not belonging, of being here and there and, and you know, what, it, what acculturation, the effects of acculturation. Um, I, I would like to invite you all if, uh, and I will send the link, the link actually will be, is here. Um, right now at the University of Maryland, we have a, um, an exhibition titled Connected Diaspora, um, social media visuality of Central Americans, something like that. But we have um, on display uh, a number of paintings by young um, Central American, Central Americans of the diaspora from the DMV and from Los Angeles and other places. And so you could see the work of these young artists there. And um, um, we've been having events, which, um, you know, we actually the, the last event happened last week, a panel with artists, but you can see at the Stamp Gallery YouTube channel panels with these artists. So I, I invite you, I invite you to visit our website at the Stamp Gallery to see these beautiful pieces of art by young artists. Um, the curator is Veronica Melendez, and she is also um, the, the producer of a zine, La Ochata Zine. So I'm bringing you to the current moment 
of newer productions by the Salvadoran diaspora, La Orchata. For any of you who, who um, um, know Salvadoran food, um, Orchata is a, a drink that actually is from uh, West Africa and travels um, with the conquest of Latin America but its origins is, is African and also, of course, you know, with enslaved people and, 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 and that migration, right? Or, well, that dispersion. And um, the, the Chata Zine uh, Collective has taken this name and, um, and made it the title of a zine, which is a compilation of different materials, a kind of DYI um, magazine. So, um, so this is, um, they already have, you know, quite a number of issues. So, um, you can look them up on Twitter and Instagram to look at more of their materials. Uh, or Chatazin again, um, very interesting, you know, bringing to date. Um, we actually have a workshop tomorrow at the University of Maryland. So for my students and, you know, we're gonna make our own zine using these materials. So um, you might wanna look us up and see what we're doing. We'll probably post our, our, our stuff at the gallery. And I also wanted to, to bring to your attention, right, that there's a whole, gamma of different artwork going on um, with young people and others. So, you know, things that have to do with graphic novels, um, with um, images, with memes, right? So this takes us into the realm of um, the diaspora on the internet, the digital diaspora. So a lot of, you know, new productions of culture that are now, you know, being displayed on, on other on social media platforms. And I bring to your attention another zine creator, Brina Nunez Peralta, who creates um, cartoons and scenes as a note to Black Central Americans who may be having issues reclaiming their Latinidad, Blackness, and Central American identity. So I kind of wanted to end with, with this discussion, right, that um, we are in the process in the, in the diaspora in Central America of also interrogating our own oftentimes um, conceptualizations of a mestizo nation at the exclusion of negritude, the blackness. And so um, the artists, the young artists, you know, uh, amongst these, um, uh, Brina Nunez and um, somebody who goes by the name of Dichos de un Bicho, this is also about the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And how we as a diasporic community, as Latinos, we need to, you know, unpack our own biases and we situate ourselves and in this case be an allyship right or in support of you know our you know black brothers and sisters and so there is a whole rethinking of you know identity in the united states and you know where central americans position themselves and you know our own um solidarity with you know other um um uh, groups that might be disenfranchised or you know whatnot right and so that's um, pretty much, you know, my presentation. I think I've come to the hour. So I, I welcome any, any questions, any engagement, anything that I can um, elaborate upon. Um, here to here to just engage with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You covered a lot tonight in your presentation. <laughs> that was a lot of information, and I'm glad that. Uh, the attendees will be able to see your slides because you have a lot of links and great information, a lot of wonderful books to read. So for those of us who would enjoy educating ourselves further, you gave us a lot of food for thought. Um, I would like to remind everybody, if you would like to ask questions, you can do so in the Q&A section. I know that we're past eight o'clock, so if you do have to leave, we understand completely. Um, but I did want to ask, I know that in our conversations um, before the webinar, you talked a little bit about a Salvadoran community group that you're involved with. Can you give us a little information about that? Yes. So, um, so I'm an educator at UMD, but I do a lot of um, um, engagement work with the community. So I, I mentioned a couple times CARESEN, the Central American Resource Center on Columbia Road. So I'm actually a board member and this is an organization that has long standing and, um, and they work um, to assist immigrants, right, on immigration issues, on um, uh, citizenship, uh, filing for citizenship, um, uh, teaching of English, um, housing. So, you know, we've become very act active in terms of, you know, um, 
housing issues in the district because you know the impact of gentrification and displacement another type of dispersion right because um uh the dc um columbia heights um, uh, adams morgan um mount pleasant is actually called like the epicenter of salvadoran migration but who can afford to live there right so there is a dispersion and people you know are have been moving right to um, Virginia, to, um, to Maryland and so forth. So that's one of the organizations I work with. I also work, um, I actually, uh, with my students, uh, we have an after school program in Prince George's County with, uh, with students. So right now, again, because of the pandemic, we're kind of on hiatus, but we work a lot because, you know, um, I, you know, I like to train, work with my students and say that, you know, we have the privilege of studying, right? So, you know, we give back, we give back to the community. And, you know, and, and of course, that uh, what we get back is even is even greater, right? So, so we do that kind of work. And um, I don't, you know, I, I, there's so many other organizations I work with. <laughs> okay, thank you. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. So the first one asks, what do you know about evangelical Christianity among the diaspora? Yes, good question because yes, it's a, it's a very um, important, um, um, you know, um, I mean, it, it's beyond like, you know, church, right? It's a very important organization. I mean, religion has great impact, right? And so, um, a, a great many of our immigrants are evangelical, right? Um, Ronald Luna, whose who's, uh, graphs I cited earlier on, um, for his dissertation, he did a study of the evangelical churches and the way that they impacted the diaspora. And he did this mapping, right, of the churches along 16th Street leading up to Maryland. And so the impact and the, and the way that, you know, they um, kind of go hand in hand with the diaspora, right? And so, um, and, and the larger history of evangelical churches in Central America, you know, the Baptist church way back in the early 19th century, uh, 20th century, its arrival, right? And the way that there's a, a long tradition. And then, you know, the, the tradition of assisting immigrants in, in the United States, um, oftentimes is very church-based or faith-based, right? With the sanctuary movement. So I think that, you know, the churches have play a big role evangelical churches play a big role in the diaspora. Um, um, Denise asks, are there languages other than Spanish that this diaspora brought with it? You referenced earlier kind of a, a new Maya language. Yes, so then, um, so yes, right, you know, um, I mentioned Maya, the artist who's, who's kind of resignifying and, and this is one of her pieces. <laughs> Right, very beautiful. Um, but yes, we, you know, like the, the migration from Guatemala is, is one of the migrations that, uh, well, it, a lot of people, it's greater, it's, it's a big migration, it's a big migration wave. And um, of course, you know, Maya speak um, about 23, if not more languages, okay? So, so you know, um, I, I've heard from many, you know, people on the ground, organizations looking for interpreters, translators, right, to be able to work with the Maya community, okay? So yes, the diaspora, it's very multilingual, very diverse linguistically, you know, the indigenous languages, and, and that's just Guatemala and, and, you know, the Maya, right? And, um, but, you know, Bolivians and, you know, and Peruvians, you know, Quechua and, and so forth, right? Which I think Northern Virginia has a, a lot of immigration from, you know, um, from the Andean region of South America, right? Um, but also um, the migration of people who, um, who speak, um, I was just talking to a student who was talking about um, Garifuna. Um, Garifuna are um, um, black indigenous people from the, the coast of Centro America and um, particularly Honduras, but there's a dispersion and there's been a great migration to the New York area, but now also to the DC area. So we're talking about people who, who speak the language of Garifuna. We're also talking about people in, in the Eastern part, the Eastern seaboard, Atlantic Caribbean seaboard of Centro America who speak you know, a variety of Creole languages, like Costa Rican Creole, Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan Creole, right? Um, so we have that language diversity, 
And um, Nahua Pipil, Nahuatl, which is, you know, the indigenous language, one of the indigenous languages of El Salvador, um, other indigenous languages from Nicaragua. Um, so very linguistically diverse, definitely. Okay, the next question is from David. Um, he asks, who is the Salvadoran Nicaraguan poet, a woman who studied and lived in Washington after leaving Central America and wrote the beautiful lyric poetry of her long career in an earlier generation? Do you know the, that person's name? Yes, so I'm glad he asked that question because she is one of my favorite poets, Claribel Alegría. She is, her work, I mean, it's so diverse, poetry, um, novels, testimonials. Um, um, oh, she runs the Gamma, right? And she studied in this area. In fact, she's a graduate of George Washington University in, I think, the 40s, 50s. 40s, 40s, because she came to study with her mentor, Juan Ramon Jimenez, who's actually, um, he was a professor in my department, and he is, uh, he won the Nobel Literature Prize, I think in 1948, okay, so she comes to study with him, and, um, and she writes, uh, you're right, she, he, she writes such beautiful lyrical poetry, and, you know, towards the end of her life or in the middle of her life, you know, she's uh, very much a revolutionary poet too, right? That um, Sandinista, and uh, I, I, she's not a Sandinista, but, you know, she, she um, writes, you know, political literature as well. So, um, be, um, so yes, Claribel Alegría, and I highly recommend her work. Ah, okay. okay, just yeah, just a follow up question. He's asking how to spell her last name so that he can find her. And she has a beautiful last name, Alegria, like in, hap in English, happiness. And it is a pseudonym, right? But that's where you'll find uh, all her works um, are written under that name. So it's spelled A L E G R I A. Alegria. Exactly, David. I see Alegria. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so we have one more question. Um, what is the best and most practical way to support um, undocumented Central American neighbors from this area? Um, yes, that's an important question, right? Because as I mentioned, um, the cancellation of TPS, Temporary Protected static, Status, is going to impact our area. We have a gr the greatest number, besides Los Angeles, right? As I mentioned, you know, great number of migrants out there. But the DC area has one of the high, because we have the largest population of Salvadoreños concentrated in one area. We have a, um, a, a large number of um, of uh, TPS holders who would be impacted if they had to leave, you know, after living here more than 20 years, forming families, having children here who are US born. And now, you know, they would have to pick up and leave, right? And, and they might be property owners and so forth, right? So that's one population. Plus we have also a large population of, um, of mothers and unaccompanied minors who came to the DC area, to the DMV, including Virginia and Maryland and, and Washington DC, who came because again, you know, we have such a large group of Salvadoreños and Centroamericanos that people, children unaccompanied would come here to uh, re, uh, reunite, right, with their parents. So that meant that, you know, we also have a large population of, of um, of young people who came as unaccompanied. So there's, there's, a, there's different groups with different situations, right? So the question, how do we support them? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, these, these laws, right, that, you know, a, a, a everyday target, right, immigrant groups, you know, I, I would venture to say, advise that, you know, we, we be very active in calling our Congress people, right? And, um, and, you know, um, stating our views and, you know, that we support and, that, you know, whatever your position is, call your Congress people, right? When these laws, you know, are being, you know, discussed in Congress. Also, you know, um, 
working with the local organizations that work on the ground, that's very important. I know that there's quite a few, I think there's an organization called CASA as well, not CASA de Maryland, but another CASA, but CASA de Maryland is also, like Casa de Virginia is in Virginia, right? And they um, assist, you know, the, the immigrants in just different ways, right? And um, so that's, you know, a way of working, uh, of assisting, you know, more in a more systematic way. But I think also, right, you know, um, um, in this, these times of pandemic, right, where people have lost their jobs and essential workers, you know, are, are just being pulled to their limits, right? Um, seeing how we can help them you know, with, you know, food and that sort of thing. There are a lot of organizations that actually are running dry in terms of, in terms of food distribution. So, you know, donating to your churches that, you know, work with the migrants to organizations like Casa de Maryland that redistribute the money in terms of food, right? And, and right now we're, you know, we're coming upon a, a uh, um, you know, the, the whole housing crisis, evictions and that sort of thing, right? So people are scrambling to find assistance in terms of you know, paying rent and all that. So finding organizations that you know and trust that will direct the money to assist the migrants, I think that's you know, really important. So there's a lot of ways to be able to assist you know, people, right? Um, but um, voting on November 3rd is very important. So I, I'll put that out there and um, calling your Congress, uh, Congress members. We have one last question. I think that's all we're going to take for tonight because we are running late. Um, Norma asks, how are migrants from other Central American nations represented in the communities and organizations of the Salvadorian di diaspora? That's a good question too, right? Because uh, as you heard me say, right, Salvadorans are the larger group, right, in, in this area. And, um, but this area is very diverse, as you all know, right? There are Hondureños, people from Honduras, people from Guatemala. We mentioned, you know, Maya migration, but also, you know, um, other migrations. Um, people from, este, um, let me see, Belize. Um, I mean, there's seven countries, right? Panama and so forth. Um, Costa Rica. Costa Rica tends to have the, the lowest mig out migration, actually. So um, that's very interesting. Um, so um, what is, you know, kind of the connection, the, the relationship, right, between these um, different diasporas? You know, it's very interesting because in Central America, I, I would venture to say, and I lived, uh, I studied in Costa Rica for, for a master's, that oftentimes we're very separated, you know, borders in Central America, right? So a lot of times we don't travel amongst the countries. In fact, I remember in Costa Rica, the Costa Ricans would say, oh, I'm going to go to Central America. Because Centro America was outside of Costa Rica, right? So I think it's in the United States when, you know, by proximity, we actually probably interconnect with others of others of other Central American diasporas because we're occupying, we're situated in, you know, in neighborhoods and so forth, right? But, you know, the idea of, um, I, I always like to respect the differences, right? Because different groups have different practices, cultural, literary, etc. So I think that, you know, that's to think of ourselves as a group, yes, but also, you know, as, as in the particularities. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions that we have time for tonight. I would like to thank our attendees for joining us and for all of their many very insightful questions. And I would like to thank Anna Patricia again for being here and for giving us this wonderful overview and insight into this community. This has been very informative. And um, again, I will email the slides and the uh, link to the recording to everyone who registered to this. So if you missed something, if you want additional information, you want to click on the links, watch some of the videos, you'll be able to do that later. And I'm going to, um, th thank you, thank you, um, David, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, please feel free to write me if you have any questions or you want to continue the dialogue. So I'm going to put my email if, um, if that would help. Absolutely. And, um, and please, you know, I, I love receiving um, receiving emails from from the public from people and 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 I, I don't know I want to I want to continue talking did it go out to everyone can you tell uh, let me see oh yeah yes email contact
Oh, Delmi, I might, I might have said David. Sorry, Delmi Flores from Fa Healthy Families Arlington. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, I don't see, I don't see it. Um, but if you put it in the chat, oh, answer live, is that it? Or um, no, an no, you can type your answer. Okay. Um, let's see. Because um, I hear I. Let me try it again. Maybe I did it individually. Ooh. Oh, there it is. Um, okay. Yes. And the question from D Flores, your uh, email is there. I'm also just going to pop that into the chat so that please. everyone can see it. Mm -hmm. And please do visit our, our, gal our, our exhibition, our Central American Diasporic Art Exhibition at UMD. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I, I guess I didn't do it right. <laughs> no, no, you did. It's just there's there's a lot of questions and a lot of um, people who are um, typing in their thanks. So. Oh. <laughs> really, thank you. I really enjoyed this, and and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you again, and good night, um, everyone. If you take a look at our calendar, you can see some of our additional events and take a look at Anna Patricia's website for more videos and more information about what she's doing. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.